This is the new and improved Off-Road Ready 2024 Honda Passport Trail Sport. Can it conquer the courses here at our Peninsula Proving Grounds? We're going to check out all the features and then put it to the test. That's coming up right now on Driving Sports TV. Just a couple years ago, Honda launched its first trail sport vehicle. It was in fact the 2022 Passport. And we tested it and found that it was pretty good, but it could use some improvement. In 2023, Honda brought trail sport to the pilot, finally adding a front tow hook, proper skid plates, and trail modes that were really optimized for rugged terrain. So here we are in 2024 with a newly updated Honda Passport Trail Sport. Did Honda finally get this one right? We're gonna answer that question and we're gonna start with the tires. With this, Honda has upgraded its tires to General Grabber All Terrains. Now these are the sport model, so they're not quite as severe as the version that came on my Ford Ranger Tremor Edition. However, they still look pretty aggressive, especially for a Honda. <laughs> and they are a 245-60 R18 fitment and they're wrapped around these really nice looking 18 inch alloy wheels. I think this is gonna really make a difference with this new vehicle. Under the hood is a 3.5 liter V6 that produces a peak 280 horsepower and 262 pound-feet of torque. This is connected to a nine-speed automatic transmission that powers all four wheels through Honda's own iVTM4 system. There are a variety of drive modes, which we'll dive into later. EPA rates economy at 19 miles to the gallon in the city and 24 on the highway. Where the Pilot Trail Sport has a big skid plate with a recovery point, this Passport just gets a few accessory skid plates on the underside and no front tow point, which is disappointing. The shocks for 2024 have been retuned. Ground clearance is 8.1 inches, which is no different than what you would find on other Passport trims. Price of the model that we're testing today, 46,330 US dollars, including destination and a $455 upcharge for radiant red paint. That puts it within a few hundred dollars of the Toyota 4Runner TRD Off-Road, which granted is due for a replacement next year, but is still a very popular option in the family outdoor SUV category. From the factory, it does not default come with a tow hitch. You have to add one as an option. If you do, this will tow up to 5,000 pounds. Under the floor, extra storage. Back here we also get a DC power socket and then buttons to fold down the second row. It is a large and perfectly flat floor, which is actually amazing to sleep on. Yeah, I'd have no problem camping out in here. I think this is bigger than my first apartment actually. Okay, let's see how this fits. It's a comfortable seating position. I can slide my seat forward and back as necessary. This is as far back as it does go. Um, I get dual cup holders here. I get a privacy screen. Um, I even get two USB-C sockets, an AC power socket, which is nice. And that's about it. Oh, I do also get a fold down armrest with integrated cup holders, but no seat warmers back here. That actually would have been a nice addition. Let's start it up. Okay. With the seat in position here. Got power adjustments, which is nice. You know, the Honda seats are usually pretty comfortable, so I'm expecting good things here. The seat also has two stages of memory. I really like this steering wheel though perforations where the grip is. Um, I also get this contrast stitching. And then of course we have adaptive cruise control on the right and then phone and gauge controls on the left. I can also control stereo over here. If I hit the home button, I can select what I want to be my main feature here. Uh, personally, I like to see how my all wheel drive system is functioning here. So let's go ahead and pick up all wheel drive torque. That'll show power front to back, left to right as well. 
And then of course this also has paddle shifters on it, which control the 9-speed automatic transmission. Now it is interesting that the Pilot has moved to a 10-speed automatic, but this one still has the 9-speed. That tells me that the underpinnings of this vehicle are still slightly older underpinnings. And that is also expressed in this interior. This is a slightly older interior for Honda. I actually like this interior, so no complaint about that. I'm just pointing out that the Pilot, it was all new last year. This one is more of a mid-cycle refresh, and that's probably why we still don't have a full skid plate on the underside with a recovery hook. Um, it's just, they did what they could with what they had, but it's moving more towards where the Pilot is now. It's just not quite there yet. Still, we have a nice space here. There's been some minor revisions, you know, the way this is all configured. It's, it's a little bit different. We get three stages of heat. Uh, we have air con as buttons, which is the way I like it. And then up here, we have a small but useful infotainment system. I like the way that Honda uses color coding so your eyes can go to what you want very quickly. Uh, we can go to, for example, Sirius XM, very easy to use. Uh, click back with some permanent buttons on the left, and then we can go to navigation. Let's try a simple search. Now this, <laughs> this unfortunately is not using a modern system like what you would get in the Toyota vehicles. Toyota lets you do freestyle searches. This one, yeah, it's not quite as fancy. Navigation. Say a navigation command. Find place. Say a place. Starbucks. Searching for Starbucks. Select an item. And then it just gives me a list here. Um, I can't see a map at the same Did time, so I have to kind of guess which one is actually the closest. Because I'm out on a peninsula, very often they give me directions as the crow flies, not road routes. And that's what we're seeing here. Go ahead and cancel very easily. This works as a rear camera with tracking lines. It also has rear cross traffic alerts, which is a nice feature. And speaking of rear cross traffic alerts, in terms of active safety, this also has blind spot warning, uh, collision mitigation. And then of course we get adaptive cruise control with lane centering, and it has lane detection as well. This does have a rear view camera, but I really wish that it also had a front view camera. On the trail, having a front view camera is just extra insurance. The Pilot Trail Sport that we tested earlier this year actually came with that. And I really like it. When you're on the trail, especially in a CUV, which isn't as rugged and ready as say a Forerunner or like, you know, obviously a Jeep Wrangler, you need to have a little bit of extra safety and a front view trail camera, it just gives you that little bit of extra safety that I think is very important. However, it is not here. So the Passport here is the poor cousin. Um, however, I do think that configuration wise, this is more appealing to me as somebody who likes to go off-roading than a pilot would be. I have no need for three rows of seats and I like the kind of stockier look of the Passport. I just wish that they would get it up to speed with where the pilot is already. But we have a lot of good stuff to work with here and we're certainly gonna use all of it. We're gonna kick this off with a street drive just to see how these general grabbers feel on regular road. Uh, and then we're gonna bring it back here to our Peninsula Proving Grounds and we're gonna see just how capable this vehicle is. We're gonna start with the easy course and then we're gonna escalate from there. Okay, let's buckle up and head out. I'm gonna start the on-road portion talking about the most important thing in this Passport, and that is the iVTM4 all-wheel drive system. Unlike many other makers in this category that rely on brake vectoring, that is applying brake to shift power left to right and right to left, this vehicle actually uses a pair of clutch packs in the rear axle, and that allows this vehicle to proactively shift power left and right as opposed to using wheel brakes to rob power, which then makes the power move to the other wheel. So it's more of an additive than a subtractive system. That means that you can actually use IBTM4 to help rotate the vehicle into the corners. I'm gonna go ahead and bring up my all-wheel drive torque display here. And it shows all four wheels right now. We're cruising, easy throttle, and it's all the power is going to the front wheels. However, the moment I start turning, a little power starts going to that outside rear wheel. 
And then when I'm going straight again and adding a little more throttle, we still have most of the power to the front, but a little bit going to the back. If I let off the throttle and I'm just barely touching it, now we're at mostly throttle to the front. So it's still a front bias system, but it's very often pushing power to the back to help with grip. Today it is cold and wet, but it's not freezing, so there's not going to be any ice on the road. Uh, but these roads can still get pretty slick, but I have really good confidence driving this because of that IVTM4. Add more throttle, punch it. Yep, still got plenty of power. Now, if I am going very slow and I add a lot of power, I get equal power front to back. But if I'm at high speed, it keeps more power to the front. And that helps with stability because it's pulling the vehicle along. Uh, whereas if you're pushing a lot of power to the back, you can kind of get a little squirrely with it. And that's one of the biggest differences between the IVTM4 system in the Hondas and the SH all-wheel drive system in the Acuras. Mechanically, very similar. However, the amount of power they put to the back and the duration for which they do it is very different. The Acuras are designed to drive a lot more like a rear wheel drive car. So you get a lot more power to the back more often. You also get more of that power left and right more often. But here driving along on this country road, this car feels great. It's very comfortable. Now, of course, we do have chunky all-terrain tires on here and they do add some extra noise to the cabin. Um, personally, though, I very often drive a truck. My personal vehicle is a 2022 Ford Ranger Tremor uh, that has Falcon Wild Peak rugged terrain tires. And not just those, they are also the E-Class, which means that they're super thick and heavy. Those make noise, although not as much as you might expect. This, I think, is fine. You know, if you're going to be driving normal, uh, nobody's going to say, hey, turn those tires down. Um, it's not that loud in here. You can hear they're there. At certain speeds, it's a little bit more apparent than others, uh, but it's not bad. It is interesting that in terms of drive modes here, Honda doesn't really play with much for on-road. If you have an Acura, for example, you have normal, sport, sport plus, or is it sport sharp? Anyway, you have all these different like road version programs. The Passport here only really has normal for street. All the other modes are snow, mud, and sand. Those are all for challenging grip situations, which we will play with in just a little bit. So in another video, I did take this onto our test mountain. Uh, and I drove this from uh, the peninsula all the way to central Washington and back. And I averaged about 22 odd miles to the gallon, which is right in there with the EPA ratings, uh, especially considering it went up a pass and down a pass. I mean, economy is not why you buy a vehicle like this. It's necessity. You need the space, uh, both for people and for cargo at the same time. And in that regard, this vehicle really delivers. It also rides really nice. Like this suspension is really nicely dialed in for street use. It's a little softer than you would normally expect, but I think it's actually quite nice. Turn in, handling. I mean, Honda always does a really good job with those aspects of a vehicle, and this Passport is no different. It really is just a nice vehicle to drive. Uh, I think the only thing where I would say is a negative is that it just feels so wide. Going over that tight bridge right there, I kind of felt a little snug, but fact is it tracks great. You can tell where it's pointing and you can tell what it's doing. Uh, these are all things that you want in a vehicle. And actually, this steering wheel feels really good. To me, the most puzzling thing about Honda's current lineup is the fact that the Pilot has been revised very significantly just last year. But this Passport, which is based on the Pilot, is still running old gear. For example, the Pilot has a newly revised 3.5 liter V6 engine. This one still has the old V6 engine. The Pilot gets a new 10-speed automatic transmission. The Passport here, yeah, it has the old 9-speed ZF transmission. Pilot gets skid plates and recovery points and a new trail logic system. Yeah, this doesn't have any of that. So it's just kind of weird. Two vehicles that are so incredibly similar uh, with the Passport kind of getting left in the dust by the Pilot. And I, I think probably one of the main reasons people would be attracted to this vehicle is it is a little bit smaller than the Pilot. Uh, but also it doesn't have three rows, but really what it comes down to is money because you're gonna save at least 
five to six thousand dollars picking this trail sport versus the pilot trail sport although personally if i was going to buy one of these today i would probably gravitate towards the pilot simply because it gives you more but that's not to say this is bad it's just not as good but does that affect you a potential buyer of this vehicle I don't think it really should because this vehicle was already very good. And with just these little tweaks they've done on the inside and then the upgrade to some proper all-terrain tires, it just made this vehicle better. So if you want to save the money and you don't need the third row, and honestly, things like skid plates and recovery points just aren't your bag, then definitely go with the Passport. The infotainment system on this vehicle for the price that they're asking, I think is a little bit on the small side. I would like at least one more extra inch here. We have a lot of this just gloss plastic in front of it. It does pick up reflections, especially off the sunroof, even though it's not a very big sunroof, it still casts reflections on the glass. Uh, but I do like this system overall. I mean, it is nicely put together. It's color coded, it's easy to use. There's nothing really terribly fancy about it. I mean, even the navigation is literally Garmin. It just, you click it and it says Garmin and you're like, okay, and it works. It's good. Now it's really kind of funny the way Honda describes their system here in the vehicle. If I want to turn on adaptive cruise control, I have to click main. Why do I click main of all things? And at that point, ACC and LKAS um, pop up. That stands for adaptive cruise control and lane keep assist system. So I'm gonna go ahead and set a target speed, which is very easy. I'm gonna pace the vehicle in front of me and it will accelerate up to a speed to gap me between this and that vehicle. And I can adjust the gap with a simple click here. We have multiple stages of distance. Um, I have used this system quite a lot recently, uh, driving this vehicle, and it's not my favorite. And the things that I don't like about the adaptive cruise is that it's, it seems very indecisive. If a human were driving the way that this ACC system works, I would be concerned. Uh, it has a tendency to really put brakes on very quickly. And then when somebody clears out of the way, it takes a really long time to accelerate back up to speed. Further, the lane detect system, when I turn that on, it's just a little twitchy. I mean, it does trace. It does a pretty good job. This is a fairly tight corner. I'm letting it do it for me. Oh, telling steering or telling me to take over steering there, which is of course fine. It's not a hands-free system. I'm only doing that to demonstrate. Uh, but like right now I'm driving and it's on and I can feel it really work in the wheel there for me. And other systems just don't feel as intrusive as this one does. So it feels intrusive and it's a little jerky, but I'm glad that it's here as a feature. So needs to be refined, still works decently enough. But I would say both uh, the most recent Toyota and Subaru systems are superior to this one. They're just, they, they just feel a lot more natural when driving them. I do actually like this display. It is very unique. And it's funny that both the fuel and temperature are kind of the most prominent things outside of the MPH. Uh, the tack is kind of thrown in the corner there. They, the cruise control system, it's kind of just tucked up in the side. I don't know, it just, it feels kind of funny what they chose to prioritize. Now I do like that I can pick a number of different things uh, for the bottom section here. Uh, I, I just feel like they could have worked on this maybe a little bit better. I mean, it's digital, but it's digital in kind of a, a very uh, structured way. You know, you don't get a lot of flexibility. And I think that's one of the biggest assets of going to a digital gauge cluster is having the option to pick a gauge cluster that looks like one you want giving me some visual options. This one, it is very structured and it is the way it is. Now in the back here, we do have paddle shifters to paddle through all nine gears. Um, are you gonna use that? Eh, I don't know. If you need to downshift, you can. Overall, I really enjoy driving this vehicle. It's comfortable. Um, it looks good. I mean, I think this is a very nice looking two row crossover. But the real question, this is a trail sport. You don't buy it just because it drives nice on sealed surfaces. You buy it for the off-road capability. So, so we're gonna take this out to our Peninsula Proving Grounds and see if this is up to the test. Can it do it? I have no idea. <laughs> Hey 
Right now, I'm gonna test how power is shifted around this system on a hard launch. Now we're on gravel, it's a little bit moist, so it's not as loose as it might normally be, uh, but we're gonna see how much power goes to the back with a slow motion camera. I'm gonna go ahead and keep it in normal first. I'm gonna turn off traction control, and the reason for that is I actually don't want traction control to interfere too much. And we're just basically gonna mosh the throttle. Let's actually put the transmission into sport. Three, two, one, and go. Now the gauge cluster up here showed me that it was equal power front to back. That was really good. <laughs> Okay, a more aggressive setting. Let's go to the most aggressive, sand. Same thing, I'm gonna put it into sport. And three, two, one, launch it. Ooh, more power to the back. <laughs> Complete wheel spin. That was awesome. So as you can see, this IVTM4 system is really good at pushing power to the back. It is not shy. Many of these systems, they start to feel a little slip and they're like, no, 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 we're gonna put all the power to the front. Not IVTM4. And that's why this system is so much fun to drive. It also makes it very capable. Let's do one last test. Sport transmission, and we're going to do uh, snow. We'll see how that affects things. Three, two, one, go. Oh yeah, really cuts power a lot. Now let's continue on with the courses. This right here is our easy course. We call it the fun forest. Uh, it is basically a dirt track that has a number of undulations, which should lift a tire off the ground. And then we can see the system as it shifts power left to right. One of the improvements on this new Passport is actually they've improved articulation a little bit by modifying the sway bar. Uh, so we'll see if it can actually reach all the way down. If it can, that's great. If not, then it'll be a real test for the all-wheel drive system. Right. I feel the rains are coming, so let's get through this. I am going to keep it in normal at first, and we'll see how that does. If we need to change modes, then we will. Because this is a dirt surface right here, these general grabbers are really, really good in these conditions. So I expect that grip won't be a problem. Now right here, we should start shifting power. Oh, so I'm noticing on the gauge here that a lot of the power is going to the back. The IVTM4 system can detect weight on the vehicle and shift more power when it detects that it's climbing. That's what I just saw right there. So we keep going through and then we go down into the dip. As we put our nose way down in the ditch right before the dead tree, we should see that rear passenger side wheel lift. And then we're gonna steer out And through. I think this this vehicle feels really wide. <laughs> Especially with these two trees right next to me. Hi tree. So we continue down here. And then we tilt. <laughs> should be lifting a wheel there. I got a tree right in front of me. Now the system should be shifting power around. Uh, can we do it with that? Okay. So at this point we're just spinning our wheels. So I'm gonna go ahead and change the drive mode to mud, um, because that should be more aggressive in shifting power around. Uh, it should also allow for a little wheel spin so that it doesn't cut power. Okay, drive. Transmission system problem. I haven't even done anything yet. All wheel drive problem. Kind of going through all the hits here. Vehicle stability problem, braking problem, he'll start a problem, everything's a problem. Okay, I get it. Everything is not happy. What the heck? It feels like it's front wheel drive now. What the heck? What is wrong with this system? 
Okay, well, let's let this system cool down and we'll see what's going on. Put it in the park. So looking at the footage, clearly it is spinning wheels both in the front and the back, but it's not adequately shifting power around for us to do anything. It is just spinning its wheels here, which is really frustrating. I said nice things about you, Passport. Why are you doing this to me? <sighs> Time to get some rocks. Well, we need to disassemble the course, I think. Let's go grab a shovel. I didn't, this is an easy course, man. Okay, so what I'm doing is I'm altering the course so that it's gonna be easier to roll out by removing this rise at the end. Most situations, unless you're on rock, can be solved with a shovel. Oh, so our big issue, I see it now, is that we, uh, the nose got stuck. It wasn't pushing dirt, but it just sat on top of it and didn't want to move. It's not planning on construction today. Woo. Can I point out that the uh, Super Cross Truck Wilderness got through here? No problem. The uh, Hyundai Palisade got through here, no problem. Even the Crown got through this portion, though I might have cheated that on the inside accidentally. This would be a great opportunity for traction boards, but I don't have any here. Note to self, bring traction boards. I think part of the problem here is that the overhang, it's much lower than it looks. Because even though you have it cut in pretty high, it goes down quite a lot. Man, I would just like to tow this out, but I can't. It doesn't even have a tow hitch. I would just get my truck, give it a yank, it'd be fine. Like, I got nothing to hook to back here. Nothing. I'm gonna roll up the rock straight and then dig all the dirt out. Okay. There we go. There we go. Finally got it up. Don't take that the wrong way. Okay, so at this point, because I have it elevated, I can take this huge rock and replace, put it under the front other side wheel. So when I settle back down, I'm not high centering. There, now we are permanently off. Wow, that's a lot of dirt. Let's try to back this up and get it out. Let's do it. Should this work? This should work. So now we're just gonna try to inch back about six inches. Keep those wheels straight. Okay, I don't wanna go all the way over it, although I think I might have. Still, we're pretty good. Yeah, you gotta always watch that seesaw. Ah, that's the problem right there. So here's the issue. That front air dam is deceptively low. You can even see the indent for the skid plate right there. Okay, let's get this out and wrap this up. Whew, this is starting to really rain. Okay, listen for dinging. I think we should clear everything, okay? Wow, that did not go like I expected. Unfortunately, because it threw a bunch of error codes and the all-wheel drive system failed, I can't take this onto the rest of the course. Uh, I can't go into the more difficult challenges because frankly, this didn't pass the easy one, which is a little disappointing. But that doesn't mean that I hate it. Even though you probably would be right thinking I should. So that's the 2024 Honda Passport Trail Sport. Overall, I like this vehicle in spite of that little issue. I think it looks great. IVTM4 is so much fun, both on the road, in the dirt, and in the snow. And I think the addition of these uh, General Grabber tires is a nice upgrade. However, if you're gonna be doing more stuff like that, you definitely wanna get the Pilot. It's new Trail Logic system. Um, all the upgrades that they've done to it, it's worth the extra money, even if you don't need that third row. 
For Driving Sports TV, I'm Ryan Douthit. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like, subscribe, share videos. We make them for you. I hope you enjoy them. <sighs> now I need to go get cleaned up. Whew, what a day.